Hi, I'm Chris Nefis, and I'd like to welcome you to another Boston Mycological Club virtual foray. I'm out here in the woods in Hamilton, Massachusetts. It's been super dry for weeks, so I'm doubtful that we're going to find very much in the way of fleshy fungi, but we'll do the best that we can. And uh, again, welcome. This is a very common early mushroom and it occurs throughout the beginning of the summer at least, kind of disappears towards fall. Um, but it's one of the Amanitas and this is one called Amanita flaviconia. Um, it's also known as the sunrise Amanita and as yellow patches. So what we want to do if we suspect we have an Amanita is we want to make sure that we get the base of the mushroom. And this is true for any mushroom that you're going to collect for identification, right? Because the base is important for the identification, right? So as you can see at the bottom of this, there's a bit of a bulb at the bottom. These are the yellow patches that you see here that gives it its name. Um, it does, it has a ring. It's a gilled mushroom, right? So it has, it has gills. These gills are fairly closely spaced. Um, that ring is um, what's left of the, the veil that <clears throat> connected the, the cap to the stem. These patches are what's left of the universal veil. When an amanita first comes up, it is uh, more or less like an egg. It's completely enclosed in a universal veil. And as it expands, that universal veil splits and leaves these little pieces of the universal veil um, down here on the on the stem and and on the on the cap. Um, Amanitas, there are a few that are edible um, and there are a few that are toxic and there are a few that are deadly poisonous. So this is uh, something that you wouldn't consider eating. In fact, um, it's not recommended that you eat any Amanitas because the, the cost of a mistake is too high. Anytime you collect a mushroom for identification, it's important not only to look at the mushroom and the mushroom's characteristics, but look at the conditions under which it was growing. So if we look up here, we'll see that we're in a, in a forest that is uh, mostly hardwood here. But if we look around, we'll probably see a few conifers as well. Um, I just walked through um, a pine forest. So if, you, if we look up, we'll see there are in fact some big pine trees that were under. Amanitas, um, like many gilled mushrooms, are mycorrhizal mushrooms, meaning um, they form a relationship with the trees that are growing around them. There's a connection between the mycelium of the mushroom and the roots of the trees, and there's an exchange of nutrients. So carbohydrate, sugars, and things um, that are needed for, for growth and energy come from the tree and in return, the mushroom, which is capable of breaking down um, organic material, supplies some nutrients, especially things like nitrates and phosphates to the tree. So it's a, a, a symbiotic relationship between the two. Although the button mushrooms that you buy in the grocery store are pure white, if you're looking for edible mushrooms in the woods and you find a pure white mushroom, it should raise a caution flag. One of the deadliest mushrooms in our region, which is Amanita bisporigera, is pure white. This, however, is not that. This is actually a white form of a mushroom called the cleft-footed mushroom, which is Amanita brunescens. It's called brunescence because it tends to stain brown, sometimes rather slowly when it's handled. It's called the cleft-footed amanita because as you can see at the base, 
there is a, a notch in the in the bulb at the base. Another diagnostic characteristic is they tend to smell like raw potatoes. This is a poisonous mushroom, although it's not considered as deadly as Amanita bisporigera. Ah, here's a truly unexpected find for today. It's been so dry, I really didn't uh, think that I would find many fleshy mushrooms coming up out of the ground. But if you look right here, you will see some chanterelles, some tiny ones. And here's some that are a little larger over here. This one is called Cantharellus enolensis. Here's a, a closer look at the, uh, at the underside of it. So they, they always describe chanterelles as not having true gills, that they really are just folds in the bottom surface. And I think you can see that. They're very often forked out towards the top. Um, the, um, the other characteristic that helps you to distinguish a, a chanterelle, in addition to the, to the color, is that they will have an, an odor reminiscent of apricots. So um, you may not be able to just pick up the mushroom and, and smell it and notice an apricot odor, but if you put it in a, in a paper bag for a little while and then open the bag, um, it should be a, a faint but noticeable apricot kind of odor. Unfortunately, uh, the worms have beaten us to this one. So if you rip it in half, you can see quite a few uh, tubes where worms have uh, made their way up into the cap. So this is probably not something you want to bring home to eat. I'd like to say a couple of words about eating wild mushrooms. There are some very delicious, fine, edible mushrooms that we can find in the woods uh, in our region. But there are also some that will make you pretty sick and there are actually some that are deadly. So it's critical before you even think about eating a mushroom that you have identified that mushroom 100% and that you know from reputable sources that it's supposedly an edible mushroom. Keep in mind that a mushroom that's edible for some people may not be edible for you. People have allergies to particular mushrooms. Many mushrooms have low levels of toxins in them that affect some people and not other people. So on that same note, it's critical that you cook any mushroom, any wild mushroom, very well before you eat it because some of the mushrooms that have low levels of toxins in them, those toxins are broken down by heat. So do not eat raw mushrooms, raw wild mushrooms. On these virtual forays, when we find mushrooms and show them to you and describe the characteristics of those mushrooms, the vision, the view that you're going to have of that mushroom and the characteristics that we list are not considered really sufficient for you to 100% identify that mushroom. Just because you find something in the woods that looks similar to one that we have found on our foray and shown to you and said this is a good edible doesn't mean that the one you have in your hand is indeed that same mushroom. So again, you need to do due diligence and you need to spend some time with keys and books and talking to other people to make certain that you've got your mushroom identified correctly. Here's a rather interesting fungus. It's, it's an ascomycete, and it's in the um, Xyleriaceae family. It's called carbon balls. And I'll uh, see if I can zoom in a little bit to give you a better look at it. There we go. And so this is called um, Daldinia concentrica. So maybe zoom in here. And I'll, I'll um, collect one in a minute to show it to you and uh, you'll get an idea of why it's called Dalbinia concentrica. I think what I'll do is there's a, a little one up here and I'll, uh, I'll collect that one. Okay, so here's the, uh, here's the, the carbon ball that I've collected. I'm gonna, I'll just cut it in half for you here. And I think you can see the, uh, the rings on here. Let me see if I can get it into focus. I'm in too close here. I'm gonna go back a bit. Uh, but 
you should be able to see these concentric rings over here. So it, it adds layers over time and produces a new spore bearing surface on the, on the outer portion of it. So it's a, a mushroom that persists from year to year and, and grows. Now this is not a mushroom. Uh, on many of our forays, beginners very often will bring these in saying, oh, I found this mushroom, this interesting mushroom. It's not a mushroom, it's actually a flowering plant. Uh, it's known by the common name Indian pipes or ghost plants. It, uh, it has a, a stalk with a, a flower at the top and uh, it's non-photosynthetic. So where does it get its energy from? So that's the question. Well, it actually uh, steals nutrients from neighboring plants, but it does it by way of mushrooms. So it has a mycorrhizal relationship with fungi, uh, very often members of the Russulales, things like Russula, and those Russula mushrooms are gaining carbohydrates through the symbiotic relationship their mycorrhizae have with the surrounding trees, very often oak trees. We're in a, a mixed oak beach and uh, what else is here? A little bit of birch and some hemlock trees, right? Um, I can, I'm gonna dissect one of the flowers for you and, and show you what it looks like uh, inside to convince you that this is indeed a flowering plant. So if I, if I remove the flower here and I'm going to uh, open it up for you and I'll see if I can get you a, a microscopic view as well. Here you can see I don't know if you can, if it's in focus or not, but like I said, I'll get, I'll get a, a close-up view of this for you in a minute. Um, you can see the, the stamens that are uh, arranged in a, in a whorl around it. It's a, it's a member of the Ericaceae, the family Ericaceae, which includes things like blueberries and cranberries and uh, wintergreen. So um, again, it's, it's a, a fairly common woodland plant in, uh, in New England shows up early in the spring and persists right through the summer. The other side of this hemlock tree is supporting a pretty good flush of Ganoderma tsugi, which is also known as the hemlock varnish shelf. And it's uh, used as a medicinal mushroom, uh, dried and ground up and used to make teas and tinctures. So it occurs, it's, a, it's an annual mushroom. It shows up first in the, uh, in the spring, fairly early and uh, by uh, late summer it's gotten pretty dry and generally is a little buggy at this point. So if you were going to collect it, you would want to do so uh, early, much earlier in the season. You can see why it's called the varnish shelf. It's, it's quite shiny. Um, if, you, if you look at the surface, the top surface, the back, the back is usually just uh, uh, covered with white pores. This one's uh, getting a little bit old now, and earlier in the spring it would, it would look much more attractive. But again, uh, called Ganoderma uh, tsugi. Tsugi is the genus of the hemlock tree. So the, the specific epithet that Ganoderma tsugi is uh, named for the fact that it, it grows exclusively on hemlock trees. This is a spot to come back to in the fall. There's oak tree that blew over in a windstorm, uh, was weakened significantly by the presence of white pocket rot. White pocket rot is caused by hen of the woods mushrooms. So it tends to uh, weaken the inner core of the trunk and leave a, a ring of, of uh, living sapwood around the outside, but still it, it's weakened enough that if you get a really big windstorm, it can blow the tree over. So this is a dead giveaway that uh, this is very likely to have a hen of the woods around the base of it uh, come September or October. So I'm going to put this on my list of places to check when it's hen of the woods season. Mycetinus scorodonius, the garlic marasmius. It's growing on the 
the base of a, a beech tree. And uh, they're tiny little, tiny little mushroom. But if you pick one up and crush it and smell it, it smells like garlic. We run a virtual foray for the Boston Mycological Club. Well, it's virtual for you. It's, uh, it, it's a, a real life foray for me. And uh, it rained very heavily last night. There were thunderstorms that went through. But uh, prior to that, it's been completely bone dry for the past month. So there's very little that's actually out now. Um, the rain should cause a few things to pop up um, in a day or two from now, but it won't have had any effect that we'll see today. Uh, there are a few, a few mushrooms that are up. Most of what's up are things that grow out of rotting wood where they are able to find a little bit more moisture. Mycena Vienna, the orange Mycena, and it pops up early in the spring and you can pretty much find it during the summer as well. Um, it's, it's very slimy when it's wet, as you can see. Um, there's a couple other characteristics. The bottom side is very, very orange as well, as you can see. Um, one characteristic it has is that the, uh, the orange part is really just the skin on the, uh, on the outside. And um, if this wasn't quite so slippery, I'd be able to peel it off for you. You can see I'm, I'm peeling it off and here we go. There we go, there's a little bit of the, the orange peel that comes off of it. Um, and you know you've got an orange Mycena if your fingers are orange after you try to do that, right? So again, this is um, Mycena liania, and it's the orange Mycena. This is something called witch's butter. It's um, in the genus Dacromyces. Actually, when you see witch's butter that looks like this, there's two possibilities. One is it could be in the genus Tremella, and the other possibility is it could be in the genus Dacromyces. They look very similar, at least superficially, and the best way to tell the difference when you're out in the woods is that Dacromyces grows on dead uh, rotting conifer logs, whereas tremella grows on hardwood logs. Uh, this is on an old pine log, and um, it's something that has, was probably here um, a few days ago before we had some rainstorms. Actually, it had been quite dry up until then, this month, and then uh, all of a sudden um, we, we got a lot of rain, and this basically just um, expanded or exploded on the on this log so I probably walked by it a few days ago when it was dry and didn't see it and then today here it is and very obvious again it just soaks up water like a sponge um, it's listed as edible it has absolutely no fragrance it has absolutely no taste uh, the only thing I've ever um, had that um, made me think it was a possibility as an edible is some students in my mycology class uh, last fall made candied witches, witches butter. I think they got the recipe online somewhere and um, it still had no taste. It was sweet, but had uh, no mushroom flavor, no mushroom smell, but uh, it did maintain its color. So it was rather interesting from that respect. Oh, I should add that um, even though this doesn't have gills or pores, it is a basidiomycete. Um, many things that are, have more uh, amorphous kinds of um, body forms uh, tend to be ascomycetes, but both tremella and dacromycetes are, um, are indeed basidiomycetes. All right, this is a fairly common mushroom for early summer, uh, late spring into early summer. And uh, it's one that has gone through a number of different name changes. The common name for this, it sometimes is referred to as the platterful mushroom, um, which, which is kind of a, a variation of what its species name was previously. 
um, but that's a different story. I'll save it for another time. Uh, the, the genus and species of this is Megacolibia rodmanii. And there's a few characteristics that we use to distinguish this from some of the other mushrooms that you might confuse it with. And one is if you look at the cap, you'll see that it has this, this radial pattern of lighter, lighter patches. So more or less streaks that, that go from the center out. So that's fairly common. It's a very fleshy mushroom. When we collect it and flip it over, you'll uh, see that the gills are quite widely spaced, very widely spaced. And uh, the, the, the gills again come right up, in this case, come right up to the, the stalk, but they really don't um, attach to the stalk. But there's not as big a space around uh, the top of the stalk and where the gills attach as we saw before in Pluteus, right? The other characteristic of this is it has very thin flesh. So if I, if I tear it apart this way, and we take a look at it, um, this is almost all its gills, mostly all gill, and there's very little, very little flesh up here. If you find really fresh ones of these, people do eat them. It is an, an edible. Um, they're, they're not <clears throat> super delicious, but there's nothing that is dis that doesn't taste good about them. Uh, the last time I had them, I was served them by a friend who seems to like them, and he cooked them using um, a combination of soy sauce and uh, a little bit of olive oil. And I have to say, it tasted quite good. It tasted a lot like soy sauce and uh, olive oil. Um, again, when they when you cook them, it's it's mostly gill. Um, they don't cook down as much as you might think. You might think it would just disappear in the pan, but it's not the case. Hey, okay, so again, a uh, common mushroom for um, spring and uh, late spring and early summer. Again, you want to look for these little striation patterns. They're, they're not really striations. They're just radial patterns of, of lighter dots on here and very widely spaced gills on the bottom. Okay, here's another example over here. I'll uh, show it to you. Here's another one. Okay, they can get quite large. Um, again, they're sometimes called platterful mushrooms because they get as big as a platter. Uh, this is a more typical size. This one's what, uh, maybe 10 centimeters across, four or five inches. So um, look for these. Just a few more words of advice on eating wild mushrooms. Let's suppose that you've found a patch of delicious looking mushrooms in the woods and you've collected them, you took them home, you've convinced yourself that you're 100% certain that these, that you know what the species is that you have, and you've checked a number of sources and they're reported to be excellent edibles. How should you proceed? Well, you should proceed with caution. To begin with, before you cook up all your mushrooms, you should set one aside, put one in a paper bag and put it in the refrigerator. Uh, this is so that it can be identified later by an expert, which will give medical personnel an indication of what kind of toxin they're dealing with. Well, assuming that doesn't happen, um, <clears throat> what you want to do then is cook the rest of the mushrooms, start with a very simple method, just saute them, make sure you cook them very well, to destroy any heat uh, sensitive toxins that are in them. And then don't eat a big plate full of them. And don't serve them to your whole family, all right? Start by eating a forkful and then put the rest of them away somewhere in the refrigerator and see how you feel the next day, all right? If you still feel well the next day, then you can go ahead and eat some more of them. Um, before you start giving them to members of your family, they should do that taste test the same way because some people are sensitive to particular mushrooms that other people can eat without any problems. Okay, on this log, we have 
a small little mushroom that usually grows in groups. And this is, that has the common name, the trooping fuzzy foot. Uh, it's a very small mushroom, but it has a very long genus and species name. It's called Xeromphalina campanella. So we'll take a closer look at it and I'll show you why it's called a fuzzy foot. I'm gonna collect one for you from, from over here and put it right there. And at the base, there's a little bit of a foot on these. And um, if we can get a better look at one, which that one doesn't seem to be wanting to show it to us, um, we should be able to find a little bit of fuzz on the base, okay? Which is where the name Fuzzy Foot comes from. There are a couple of interesting uh, fungi right here on these uh, dead uh, branches. They're the one on the right that's uh, a little more orange colored is called a false turkey tail. And uh, the one over here, this jelly fungus here is called the amber jelly. And its genus and species is Exidia resiza. Um, you can find these year round. They're, they're not poisonous. Um, some people have made candied um, Exidia which is kind of interesting, but uh, doesn't have any real mushroom flavor, but that's one, one possibility. And then this one, the uh, false turkey tail, is in the genus Sterium. So the, the difference between this and a turkey tail, although it has sort of a superficial resemblance, um, is apparent from the backside. A true turkey tail mushroom, the backside is white and it has, is made up of tiny little pores. The backside of sterium uh, is not white, and if you look very closely, you really won't see any pores on here, although this is indeed the spore-bearing surface. Okay, it's also um, much thinner. The true turkey tail is thicker, thicker than this. Here's a rather greenish looking Rusula. I believe it's probably Rusula parvovirescence uh, based on the quilted pattern on the top. There are of course several other Rusulas with quilted tops, including Rusula crestosa. Rusulas are notoriously hard to identify for, so my confidence in this is not very high. Here we have a smallish buff to gray uh, mushroom growing out of a rotting log. If you look at the top, you'll notice it has a bit of an umbo, that, that bump in the top. That's where the, the, uh, the stipe, the, the stalk, comes up and attaches to the cap and sort of pushes it up. Um, there's a couple of possibilities on, on what this is, and we won't know for sure until we collect it. Um, but my guess is that it may be Pluteus. So there are several species of Pluteus. Uh, one of the really common ones is Pluteus cervinus, the deer mushroom. Um, so well, I'm, I'm going to um, collect this and turn it over and look at the underside. And actually, I'm going to smell it because that's an important characteristic for identifying uh, Pluteus cervinus, the deer mushroom. Okay, so let's take a closer, a closer look at this. Um, it's important when you collect a mushroom to make sure you get the base of it. In some cases, that's important to help identify it. In other cases, not so much. And so um, this mushroom, uh, I'm going to try and get it up closer to the lens for you. Um, again, you can see it has an umbo on the, the cap. The cap is smooth, right? You don't see any lines or striations or, or wrinkles on it here. If it had wrinkles on it, um, it, it could still be Pluteus, but it would be a different species, one called Longus striatus. This is not it. Okay, I'm going to flip it over. And when we look at the underside, um, you'll notice it has a pinkish, a pinkish color. Okay, that's characteristic of, of Pluteus. And if you also look at the way the, the um, stipe, the, the stalk is attached to the cap, there's a, a, a depression all around it so that the gills are not actually attached to the stipe. Okay, so their gills are what are referred to as free. And, and this has what some people refer to as a, a ball and socket construction, meaning the, the, the stipe goes into the cap. And if we go like this, we can actually just pull the, 
pull the stipe right out and you'll see here's the the ball right and there's the 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 socket left here and we didn't rip any gills in doing that right okay so the last characteristic uh, to confirm that this is um, Pluteus cervinus would be to smell it which I'm going to do and if it it does it smells like radishes then we can be pretty certain that this is Pluteus cervinus right um, it's an edible mushroom it's poor um, poor to, to it, at best most people don't bother to collect it um, it's pretty, uh, this particular um, example of it's pretty small. They can get fairly large though. They can get, you know, more or less this size. And, uh, but uh, most people uh, don't bother with them in terms of looking for something that's edible. Anyway, Pluteus cervinus. Smells like radish, the deer mushroom. Here's another look at a Pluteus. Again, growing out of a, a rotting log and key identifying factors are the, the way the, the stalk is inserted into the cap and uh, it gives it that ball and socket kind of construction. We'll go up to the top here and you'll see there's a bit of an umbo, a bump, where the, the stalk is attached up through the top and it has this pinkish color on the bottom. And uh, again, if you were to smell it, it should smell like radishes. The gills are quite closely spaced. Here's an example of a red rusula. There are hundreds, maybe thousands of species of rusulas, and they're very difficult to tell apart. Um, <clears throat> there are dozens of red rusulas in the Northeast, and uh, it, it takes an expert to distinguish them. Even using DNA, uh, it's very hard to tell them apart because many of the DNA sequences that have been deposited on GenBank um, are not posit from positively identified specimens. So uh, again, it's, it's a real challenge to figure out exactly what these are. Some of the brucellas are edible, some of them are toxic. Uh, most of the guidebooks will list under red rusula is a species named Rusula emetica, and you can guess from the species name emetica um, that it's probably not one that you would want to eat. Again, it has the same characteristics of uh, the other rusulas. This, the stems will snap very easily. Uh, a difference between this one and what we were looking at uh, earlier in a, a green rusula is if you look at the the gills, you'll see that they're not forked. So this is one characteristic that can be used to narrow down the identification. It takes a, a tuned eye to, to spot these. They camouflage themselves pretty well. And uh, this is one of the, the prized edible mushrooms uh, that grows in our area. And uh, they, they start mid-July. Some people think of them as a fall mushroom, so you can find them, find them right throughout the summer. From this one, it's a little easy, going to be a little easier to see why they call this a black trumpet. Um, basically, um, sometimes they just look like a hole in the ground, so they are difficult to spot. But as we get a little closer here, I think it should become a little more apparent. Here's our black trumpet mushroom. A couple more over here. Black trumpets are a mushroom that you should definitely learn to positively identify. They're absolutely delicious with seafood. Put them in melted butter when you're having lobster or poured over swordfish, outstanding. Well, I'm afraid it's time for us to wrap up our virtual foray. I hope you've enjoyed it. Until I talk to you again, get out there in the woods.